Okay, well, I'm just going to remind everybody of the rules of the game for the panel. So I understand that each speaker has 15 minutes. I'm going to use my very old-fashioned... I used to feel very technically savvy with my BlackBerry. Now I'm very, very old-fashioned, but I'll use that to help keep us on track. I think it's probably easiest for me to introduce all the speakers right now. Um, like everybody else uh, in this, people have wonderful, long and rich uh, biographies and experiences that speak to their different ways of, of engaging. Um, let me first introduce uh, Dr. Julio Mayol, uh, who is, I think, a local. Um, and he graduated from here. He spent some time at one of my favorite hospitals in Boston, the Beth Israel. Um, and he's actually back here as chief of the Division of Colorectal Surgery. Um, he's also a principal investigator in uh, one of five national projects and the scientific leader of regions of knowledge in the seventh FP. And I'm not quite sure what that means, but framework plan, program, which sounds like one of those things that uh, the European Union has conjured up. So uh, <laughs> good luck in that. Uh, Brian Perea, you've already uh, been introduced to uh, yesterday. Uh, he's a nephrologist. Uh, he was president and CEO of Amgen Pharmaceuticals. He's also had a lot of experience in hospital administration as president and CEO of the physician organization at Tufts. Uh, he's involved in, um, has been deeply involved in HST, and I personally have really benefited from the support that he's given a lot of the things that uh, I've been engaged in with Martha and others. He's also engaged in the not-for-profit uh, world, uh, part of the National Kidney Foundation, and so on. Um, so thank you, Brian, for participating with us again. Uh, Manuel, Manuel um, Desco, again, you've already, I think, is known to most of you. Uh, he also is a local. He's a specialist in nuclear medicine. Uh, he, I think, has the, the, the honor and the challenge of uh, chairing the Spanish Excellence Network on Technological Innovation in Hospitals, ITEMAS. ITEMAS, um, again, you know, one of these sort of opportunities opportunities to try and bring people together uh, in new ways. He is one of those consummate people that we do hold up as a role model, as a researcher um, and an entrepreneur, and so we really value his uh, participation. And finally, Tim Harper, who I think it might be a fellow countryman of mine, is that correct? Although I haven't heard him open his voice. And an ex-local, wonderful. Uh, so his Spanish will be better than mine, but I think he will speak in English. Uh, is a serial entrepreneur and somebody who, as well as uh, launching the first atomic force microscope in space, um, is now, I think, somebody who's, again, engaged in really building out an ecosystem specifically around nanotechnology. That would be one of the other kinds of examples that one might have talked about as a particular focus, where uh, certainly in the UK and in some other countries, people are saying that's one of the things we might want to build an ecosystem around. And so we're very grateful, Tim, to have you here sharing your experiences with that. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to our first panelist. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, the title, I didn't know you were going to speak about um, It Takes a Village. So uh, the title is uh, An Innovation Village Inside. <laughs> uh, let me begin with a brief outline of my presentation today. I will speak uh, about three things. Uh, first, the history of our hospital and its, its innovation in, uh, unit. Second, the working definition of innovation we made, and finally, uh, how we organize and manage innovative initiatives within our institution. Um, Hospital Clinico is the oldest academic institution, hospital in Madrid, and in 2012, we are celebrating 225 years. Uh, an historic landmark on its present location, it was the battlefront of the Hispani during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and although it is a, a university hospital with uh, over 900 beds and over 5,500 uh, 5, employees actively involved in national and international uh, research projects, innovation had not been in its DNA uh, until 2009. In the spring of 2009, uh, and stirred up by an initiative uh, of the Spanish National Institute of Health to fund uh, the establishment of innovation units uh, within academic hospitals in Spain, a group of professionals uh, with no specific background in managing biomedical innovation got together and decided to act. Uh, the, wall, uh, the, uh, the goal was to modernize our institution, making it more competitive and attractive for both patients and professionals. Uh, moreover, we wanted to uh, be able to process internally generated biomedical knowledge and to use it as an engine for our economy in times of crisis. 
it was an exciting project, but the, uh, a PI, a uh, principal investigator, that was needed. Um, you know, I'm a surgeon, so I'm a well-adjusted psychopath. Um, I accepted uh, leading the proposal. Uh, motivated by my own frustration, uh, shared with a friend of mine who is an interventional radiologist now at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he experienced both, uh, we, we experienced that frustration when we tried to organize an image-guided uh, image guided surgery unit at our institution. But truth be told, I had been trained to be a surgeon to uh, cut an abdomen open, uh, taking the gut out, and putting things back together. So I can cut you into pieces and it's legal. That's what I've been trained for. Um, I have also been trained to create knowledge through basic and clinical research and to publish it. I know how a chloride ion moves through the apical membrane of the epithelial cell and uh, I know how to measure it, I, I, how to, I know how to image it, um, but that was about it, uh, nothing else. But uh, since I accepted being uh, the leader of this project, uh, I accepted being recognized as the one who has the arrows in, in his back. <laughs> so as Steve Jobs explained it in his two, uh, 2005 commencement speech at Stanford, I started connecting the dots looking backwards. Uh, if you look at this picture, you'll see the place the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, uh, I, I lived just across the street of Children's Tower, uh, and, and my son was born there, where I worked in the second half of the 90s. It was about time to show that the uh, public funds that the Spanish uh, National Institute of Health spent uh, uh, trying to fund me to stay there uh, were, not, were not a total waste. And the single most important thing that I learned at the Beth Israel was that um, the secret to succeed is to ask relevant questions. Uh, and in the biomedical world, it's even more so. So I started playing the game with myself, with others, and, and the first question was key. What is innovation? Innovation in the uh, 21st century is a kind of a lesser god. Many talk about it, but fewer have seen it. Uh, and, and after doing some research, uh, we decided what it was not. And innovation is not research or development, it's not renewing technologies, and it, it is not novelty. That's not innovation. Uh, let me use an example. Many people think that if you have one apple and you can get more apples, uh, you are innovating. Yeah, for, that, for us, it is not. We believe that innovation is about transforming an apple in a new product that opens new opportunities. That's what we think. And uh, within the biomedical field, innovation is about changing the model. That's our working definition. Definitely, uh, a, def a decision was made. Our innovation unit should be an open platform to promote change and progress within our institution. It should be an integration system for innovators and empowered to access the market with the products and services designed and created. Uh, however, nobody said it was going to be easy. Trying to better understand how to do it, I went back to study what my mentors and friends were doing in Chicago, now in Chicago. Back then, they were at the Beth Israel. But now, Jeff Matthews is the uh, head of the Department of Surgery at the University of Chicago. And, um, Madhu Prasad is the uh, director of the uh, uh, Innovation Institute at uh, Henry Ford in Detroit. And I found their initiatives and approaches inspiring as they were in the past. Basically, we did not come up with uh, any original thoughts. We simply copied others. In brief, healthcare has been designed to deliver healthcare services to teach and train people, to generate knowledge through research, and of course, this complex structure needs management to keep working. Multiple resources are required to pursue its mission. The interaction of people and resources produce some kind of energy 
that oftentimes is wasted because no specific tool is in place to capture it. And that's what our innovation units should be taken care of. To create such an integration tool, two engineers, a journalist and a documentalist, teamed up. Let me be frank with you. Nowadays, no, nothing significant can be achieved without a good team, so we hire A-plus people. Together, a functional structure was designed and set up. All scientific and non-scientific stakeholders were identified, mapped, and included in the model. But that was not the core of the initiative, because from the very beginning, it was recognized that innovation in healthcare is about people, and they should be able to enter and exit our organization freely. One of our principal concerns uh, is after the internal analysis where uh, the lines, the research lines and the innovation lines were identified, one of our principal concerns is talent and creativity. There is no way things can be improved without engaging talented, committed people because they bring young blood and divergent perspectives in. So we went out to actively recruit them. Through a philanthropic donation, the Young Investi Innovator Award was established, and two young undergraduate students at Universidad Rey Juan Carlos were the winners of the first edition that we celebrated a couple of months ago. Again, a think tank of surgeons and engineers from the Department of Surgery and Engineering of renowned academic institutions in the United States and Spain uh, was established. The power of putting smart people together was fascinating. In addition to that, human are social beings that enjoy thinking and creating their own solutions. So we started this session, Ideas Incubator, um, so people can present their ideas and we try to network and help them out. But creative people think their ideas are valuable. Let me be frank with you. The value of an idea is zero until somebody wants to buy it. They must be taught and trained to first transform the idea into a project, then a business plan. And finally, they must be knowledgeable enough to create a startup company. And that's what we do with a business school, the uh, AOE. They need support, and we are in charge of providing them with solutions to their needs. <coughs> of course, we use social networks. And uh, one of the things we do, we use YouTube to disseminate our ideas incubator initiatives. And finally, this is what we have recently launched. We want to transform the model. We don't think that this model, the uh, healthcare model, is sustainable at all because it's, it's, uh, it's ill from the very beginning. It's just the cost this is described by uh, uh, an American uh, economist, William Bomo. We are adding complexity to the system and we cannot do that. If we don't dismantle complexity, we are not going to uh, reach sustainability. So that's the, the objective of this laboratory. Finally, you always find light in the tunnel and at the end of the tunnel. And meeting Martha and the Ambition Initiative was light in the tunnel. And we appreciate it very much. And finally, I'm going to leave you with a very short video clip that shows how to start a movement. I'm a tester myself, and in fact, I organize a technology entertainment and design X event here in Madrid. And I'm going to leave you with one of these video clips. Uh, in th under three minutes, they're going to explain how to start a movement like this, this innovation movement. There should be sound. A little bit louder, please. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course, you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. 
So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so. Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So, first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first, and he'll get all the credit. But it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I think this is the... Uh perfect place, place to be followers, the first followers. Let's follow ambition and let's follow Idea Square. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, good to be back. Uh, I don't have slides. <laughs> uh, after being a professor f uh, for a long period of time, I went to business school. And when I came out of business school, this was 15 years ago, uh, I, I found that uh, at business school, people don't use slides, and the message was uh, uh, equally persuasive. So as I moved in my career to the dark side and to the darker side and to the darkest side, uh, I used fewer and fewer slides. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how many of you have read uh, the Spanish uh, translation or the English version of Jim Collins' book, uh, Good to Great. Any hands? <laughs> Great. Uh, what? Well, at least there are three of us, so we're joining the crowd. Uh, he says the, the key to success, based on the history of companies uh, that succeeded, is one, you've got to be passionate uh, at what you do. Two is you have a realistic chance to be the best at it. And three, you need to make money. And he called this the hedgehog principle because when the fox tries to eat the hedgehog, the fox is a very smart animal, has many strategies. But the hedgehog has only one strategy, and it does it well. It curls itself into a ball with the spine sticking out and protects itself. <laughs> and so I think in this underlying principle, uh, uh, there is a path forward uh, for organizations. Because at any given time, uh, resources are unevenly distributed. Uh, at any given time, the market competitiveness or market leadership seems to be established, and it's daunting for a new person to compete and, uh, or a new organization. So I think the title of this, uh, 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 this, uh, this panel discussion is very uh, appropriate as to how do you find a way uh, to be competitive by sometimes taking the road less traveled? <laughs> what I'd like to do is um, extend on Jim Collins' observations a little bit. 
in addition to being passionate, in addition to being realistic as to what you can be good at, and having a good understanding of uh, how to make that profitable, I think you need to be introspective uh, because you really don't want to have an idea which is impossible to achieve and a glorified view of your own skill set. And the second is uh, you need to be sure that you can persevere through it. But most importantly, we have to remember that sometimes metrics of success uh, can take some time to evolve. And uh, instant success, such as Instagram, which went from zero to $1 billion acquisition in literally 12 months, are uh, the exception. They're not the rule. <laughs> so I'll give you an example from my own uh, experience. When I came to Tufts Medical Center in 1990 to Boston, Tuft, the division of nephrology at Tufts was really famous for basic science research. All of the acid-based physiology and electrolyte physiology in the field of kidney disease was discovered or researched at, at Tufts. But you know, by that era, uh, acid-based physiology and electrolyte disorders were past history. Uh, most, uh, a lot of understanding had evolved. And research centers across the US uh, had evolved over time to looking at immunology, structural biology, and so on and so forth. So the division of nephrology at Tufts was no longer the leader in basic research. So if you wanted to do a fellowship in Boston, you would first go to the Brigham or the Mass General, uh, if not uh, to the Beth Israel Hospital. It's Fiona's favorite because if you want to have a baby, you'll go to Beth Israel, okay? <laughs> My wife is a neonatologist. <laughs> uh, so I know the hierarchy in where to have a baby in Boston. Uh, but the, the reality was that you would not go to Tufts Medical Center as your first choice. So it was not my great idea, but a visionary, Andy Levy, who is now the chief of nephrology, at that time was an assistant professor, and I was his only fellow. There were just two of us. He was the guy who took the shirt off, and I was the guy who joined him in the dance. <laughs> and we asked ourselves, we said, you know, it costs a lot of money to set up a basic science laboratory, equipment, supplies, but it didn't cost much money to set up a clinical research group. We said, you know, we could build the best clinical research group. To make the wrong story short, between 1990, when I joined him, by 1995, between the two of us, we had approximately 10 people. By the year 2000, when I moved on to run the hospital, uh, we had between the two of us about 30 people, and today, the Division of Nephrology at Tufts Medical Center is unquestionably the number one clinical and outcomes research group in nephrology in the world. So it was built out of adversity. We didn't have the money uh, to build a lab. Uh, so we said, OK, what's the other path? <laughs> now, years later, when I became the president of the National Kidney Foundation, we had two assets. <laughs> one is an annual meeting. every organization wants to put together a meeting. And the second is journal. That's the American Journal of Kidney Disease. Now, every journal tries to be the number one in its field by the citation index, right? So the leading journals at that time in basic research and clinical research were Kidney International and the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. And the American Journal of Kidney Diseases, which was published by the National Kidney Foundation, was an also ran, struggling to be third. So we made a determination saying, you know, why can't we position this as the clinical research journal where the best papers in clinical research are published? And I must tell you, in 2010, the American Journal of Kidney Diseases is the number one journal for clinical research. Anyone wants a good clinical research paper published? They publish it in the American Journal of Kidney Diseases. And the last example I'll give you is the National Kidney Foundation. 
uh, when I came to the National, when I became the president of the National Kidney Foundation, <coughs> we used to have an annual meeting which was catering to all nephrologists. But we had a meeting with 1,000, 1,500 people, while the American Society of Nephrology used to have that annual meeting with 10,000. Because they had all the cutting edge research presented there. And globally, anyone had a great research paper, it was presented there. So I said, listen, let's, there's no point in trying to do the same thing as everyone else. For a practicing clinician, there is really no great meeting that they can attend and learn all they need to know about their practice. So let's reposition uh, the meeting as a pure meeting for the clinical nephrologist. And we did that, and now years later, it costs us less to market the meeting. It costs us less to run the meeting. We have practicing nephrologists the world over who come to the meeting, and it works. And finally, I'll give you an example of my own home country, India. <laughs> When I left India in 1990, when you applied for a telephone for your home, it took 10 years <laughs> to get a telephone. So I had applied, when my wife and I got married, we had applied as soon as we got married and through connections and you know how things work in developing countries. Just before leaving India, we got our telephone allocated. Now that was the most precious commodity. So when we were leaving, we kept that in cold storage, that telephone number, because we didn't want to release it and we kept paying the monthly bill because we never knew when we came back to India whether we'd have a telephone. But when the cell phones came in, India became a rapid uh, adopter because even today, when I call my parents in India on the landline, the landline is invariably out of order. Uh, when it functions, the reception is poor, but the cell phone works. The same is true for Indian roads. Indian roads are in terrible shape. And India had one airline, which was a government airline. That's why in India, the manufacturing sector never took up in a big way, unlike China. But in contrast, the information infrastructure did not require planes, roads, or anything else. The landlines, because of the cell phone providers, were irrelevant. So Indian information technology took off in a big way because it took the pathway wherein the resource for that pathway was available. And so I'd like to wind up there saying that oftentimes as, as entrepreneurs, either in the field of education, in products, or services, one looks, one has great ideas, but one looks at the landscape and say, wow, the leadership is already established. So how do we enter and how do we compete? So it may make sense uh, to think about uh, the key principles that I said at the start. If you have a great idea and you're passionate about it, uh, if you realistically think, and I'm saying realistically think that you can be the best at it, and that it can be profitable, uh, I think that always think about uh, the road less traveled because that may be the pathway uh, to your own success. And I think uh, ambition is a perfect example. <laughs> Everybody wants to innovate in three areas. Cardiovascular disease, oncology, and neurodegenerative diseases. Go to any hospital in Boston, you ask them, what are your core uh, centers that you're putting in all your resources? It's cardiovascular, oncology, and neuroorthopedics, degenerative diseases. But the reality is everybody does that, then how do you separate out? I think the, 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 the decision to set up an innovative hub in the field of imaging in the broadest sense of the term was a great idea. And I think the execution of that idea has been equally impressive. And I think the only caution that we all need to accept is results take time. And we need to practice patience. Thank you.
This is the title Martha gave me for the talk, Breaking Through the Professional Barrier. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to transmit you some personal impressions about this process. First of all, please let me state one, the, the very first, the very big, and, and the most critical question every Spanish innovator asks himself many times. Is this going to be possible at all? <laughs> and uh, the answer to this question, I mean, if you are Tom Cruise, the answer is yes. <laughs> if you work at MIT, the answer is very likely yes. But if you are working in Madrid, things are much hairier, I'm afraid. And uh, well, my answer is it's not impossible, but be prepared to invest a lot of effort. And uh, um, what I intend to do in, in this short talk is to present you some lessons we learned from experience. And, and for that, we have uh, selected uh, one example from uh, among our innovations. It's not the, mo the, the, the most um, scientifically sounding innovation we made. It's not either the innovation which has produced more revenues, but it's probably the most illustrative in, in, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, discussing about the barriers we can find. The example uh, starts uh, once upon a time, 1997, the head of the oncology department uh, showed up at my office with a problem. And uh, the problem is that, uh, let, let me very briefly explain what uh, intraoperative radiation therapy is about. Intraoperative radiotherapy is a procedure in which uh, surgery and radiation therapy are combined in, in a single uh, session. So uh, it has several ad biological advantages because you can protect normal tissues in an easy way. You can just take, it, take them out of the, of the beam of radiation and you can use this kind of applicators. And uh, as a consequence, you end up with a minimal tumor burden after the procedure. So biologically, it's very interesting. However, the problem is that to monitor and to estimate the doses you are applying is very difficult because w w when you operate the patient, you change the anatomy, you change the geometry, and that no longer matches the preoperative images. So uh, most uh, surgeons and, 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 uh, and radiation therapists are uncomfortable with this thing because they don't have a clear quality control. So that was the problem, and uh, our solution to the problem, well, first of all, before the solution, this was not our problem. This was the problem of, of, the, of the physician. So first point, which has been uh, stressed many times uh, in, in, in this conference, try to face real problems, problems a clinician has. This is one of the barriers. The, there's the barrier between the clinicians and the engineers. In our case, that barrier was not so difficult because of two reasons. One is that my double background in medicine and, and engineering, and the other is that we work and we live in the hospital. That's very important, I think. And unfortunately, to my knowledge, we are the only group in Madrid for sure, but probably in Spain, we are the only group of engineers which is actually working inside the hospital and, and can have a coffee with the, with the surgeon. So that's a, a very important barrier. It was not for us, but maybe for many other people in Spain. So, when analyzing the problem, we realized that it was uh, quite interesting from the technical point of view because it's the, the tool to solve the problem was not a visualization tool, was not either a simple dosimetry algorithm, was not a simulation program, but was a mixture of everything. So uh, we analyzed the market and there was no competence. And, and besides, there's a clear market for that. We, we know exactly who's working in intraoperative radiotherapy. And also the market has another advantage is that if the whole thing works, the market can increase uh, enormously. Because if you can convince other uh, uh, radiotherapies that this works, then you can increase the market. So it looked nice. Second key, identify the business model. When you are going to talk with the industry, don't present just your idea, but present also what's going to be once it's uh, turned into a product. So we developed a proof of concept. It worked nicely. We prepared a few papers. And then we started looking for a company able to deal with this kind of critical software. And it was impossible. We, were, we couldn't find any company 
and the project didn't die, but let's say entered into a sort of lethargic state and was so uh, find the proper company. Then if you are not able to find the proper industry to receive the innovation, then you are lost. In our case, the project was sleeping in one of my drawers for eight years. And then finally, we came across a company <laughs> that was able to deal with that kind of software. Eight years. This is, there are good news and bad news. The bad news is that we lost eight years. Good news is that the idea seems to be so original that it survived eight years being original. So if, if you want to be positive, that, that's the way of looking at the other thing. Third key in the process, innovation is not a short term process. So you have to be patient. And uh, if you are Spanish, you have to be also very resilient. OK. So once we found the company, the process restarted. And then we started struggling with the IP issues and all the contact with the company. Um, I cannot explain all the details of, of that process here because I've been recorded. But believe me, it was a nightmare. I can give you details after the session. It was a real nightmare. And uh, my lesson learned from here is that uh, you need proper advice and, and management and that the legal framework here in Spain is still, I hope, rather stiff. So there are a lot of actions we can do in order to make this uh, framework more flexible. You may have a question. Why we did not patent at the beginning? And uh, well, wh one of the answers for this is that uh, we usually do not patent and unless we have a clear idea, we, ha we have a clear idea of what the final commercialization of the program is going to be. So otherwise, what you do is to waste money accumulating patents. And one lesson from this is that the goal of, of innovation is technology transfer, is not to produce patents. And many people mistake the indicator with the real thing. So transferring technology is not issuing patents. And you can transfer technology without patents. And unfortunately, you may have a pack like this of patents without any technology transfer. So finally, we got it. The product was finished. It passed the CE marking and the FDA clearance and started commercialization. And at that moment, things start growing uh, in, in a sort of snowball effect. So a lot of people uh, came involved in the project and many different uh, public funds were uh, raised to continue. Uh, evaluation projects and different universities, different hospitals. Another lesson here, let it grow and don't be mean. Or at least, if, as it's my case, if you are mean, but, but slightly intelligent, act as if you were generous, <laughs> because it's better in the end. So in this case, if, if you insist in keeping the, the whole control and, and if you think that nobody is going to get one euro from this project because it's my idea and it's mine, then you are killing the baby. Uh, so uh, let it grow. Don't be mean. And uh, to end, this is a relatively complex formula here, but to illustrate this, uh, this effect of the snowball, uh, this is a, this is a, mm, a model of, of growth that uh, in, in that reference, and this represents the number of new ide ideas per year, for instance, and this is the number of existing ideas in the institution, and the H represents the uh, amount of resources you apply. So forget about the exponentials, that's for fitting and are not relevant, but uh, if this model works, this model, by the way, is very common in, in many different situations. This is probably the, the simplest of the differential equations that govern many biological and physical processes. And uh, this leads to several, first, the, the snowball effect comes from here. The more ideas you have, the more new ideas you get in t uh, with time. Uh, one interesting thing with this formula is that uh, apparently there's no, uh, I mean, if you start from zero, you cannot bootstrap, so it doesn't work. So unless you have something, you cannot start. And uh, 
Another interesting consequence from this that was uh, that was uh, discussed by Fiona in, in, the, in previous session is uh, whether it makes sense to put all the money in those places which work and not spread a, a little amount of money among uh, everybody. So, uh, well, this is called the Matthew effect and that uh, comes from, you know, surely it's a well-known effect in economy and, and in ecology. And it's uh, from the Bible and, and there's, a, there's a versicle in, in in Matthew, which says that uh, uh, those who have more, more will receive, and those who have very little, even that little will be retired from them. So, and that's called the Matthew effect, and suggests as that for, for politicians, if you want to have returns in terms of money, the best idea is to put your investment in those few places which actually work. But probably you have to take measures to um, support bootstrapping uh, and of those places who, who which already are not uh, in, in such a level. So probably means that you need two types of calls. One call for people who are actually doing uh, innovation and a different call to support those who are going to start. So again, this is a lesson for politicians. I'm afraid there is no politicians in the, in the room. It's a problem, but uh, okay. So summarizing my, my key points here, uh, find the real problem, identify the business model, find the proper company, be patient and resilient, get advice to, I say, to fight regulations, not to comply with regulations, to fight regulation in our case. Uh, do not mistake patents for technology transfer and let it grow. Don't be mean. I'm very happy because all these uh, points are personal learning points and they match very well the, the mm, the knowledge of those who really know what they do in, in this case. And uh, these points were not taken for any uh, innovation manual. Uh, they were taken from innovation manual, who's, who's, who's me. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, it's three fascinating talks so far, so I'll uh, do my best to follow. Uh, what I'm going to talk is about is really... Um, how we managed to um, leverage about uh, a quarter of a billion dollars to try and persuade a lot of governments and organizations to use innovation to make the world a better place. And I think we're getting to the stage where, uh, where that's just about to, uh, to happen now. So we're talking about the economic impact of technology, but really a lot of this comes down to making sure that we have the ecosystem in place to be able to translate technology into, uh, or innovation into uh, some kind of impact. And, and what that involves is a lot of really trying to sell it to um, key decision makers in governments and, uh, and at the sea level of large corporations. And what you often find is that when you come up with a new technology, whether it's nanotechnology or synthetic biology or anything else, there's a lot of resistance to any new ideas. And uh, you know, it's the classic innovator's dilemma. So um, what do I know about it? Well. This is me about uh, 20 years ago at the European Space Agency, and this is me after 20 years of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, so I'm not sure I can recommend it from a, from a health point of view. So I, I set up a, a lab at the European Space Agency, really trying to take things apart atom by atom. Um, I, since then, I've set up half a dozen companies. Uh, some have been in areas such as scientific instrumentation, and uh, the one I'm currently engaged in is uh, a very low-cost point-of-care diagnostics based on uh, organic electronics that we think is truly transformative. And the, uh, the question now is how can you convince investors of that as well, which is often a stumbling block. Um, to keep my hand in, I, I chair and I'm the sort of chief advisor of a lot of national funding bodies when we're looking at sort of emerging technologies and nanotechnologies and trying to figure out what, at a scientific level, we can encourage. Uh, and really, uh, a lot of this is a story of how we sold uh, this idea to organizations like the World Economic Forum. And the reason we got involved with the World Economic Forum is because uh, back in about 2004, uh, the insurance company Swiss Re wrote a report identifying nanotechnology as a potential major threat to uh, economic stability in the world. And uh, they rounded up some experts, and one of them was me. Um, and 
as a result of that, uh, I suppose you put all that together, what we, what we try to do, or what I try to do, is try to predict the future, which is a good thing because uh, a lot of governments and corporations are very interested in that. As an entrepreneur, it's a bad thing because you always end up being two or three years ahead of the curve and uh, being, the, uh, the, being the MySpace instead of the Facebook. So what we're building on, and how we sold this, really, is by talking about why we're doing science and, and, and where this is going. So we've been doing science for... 5,000 years, maybe 10,000, but we've only got evidence of it for the last 5,000 years because we didn't invent any form of writing before then. Um, we've been significantly changing the world as a result of science and technology for at least the last 100 years, but we're only just becoming aware of that over the last 20 years or so. And when we're talking about some nanotechnology, synthetic biology, biomimetics, things like that, we're really talking about materials, and materials have really shaped our culture and economy, going back 10,000 years where we just found things in the environment, a bit of stone, a bit of wood. Uh, later on, we got more sophisticated and started realizing that there were things like ores that you could extract and so on, and uh, the, that complexity has increased, and that's been really about control over materials, whether that's just by using animal skins for, uh, for clothing, all the way through to sort of semiconductors and satellites, which, in quite, which require a lot of modification. You can't just dig up the components for something like that. Um, now, the other component when we're looking at technology and trying to sell this to people is we've got to relate it to pe things that people understand. And, and one of the biggest problems that we have at the moment isn't just population. We have to plan for a world of nine billion. But we have an increasingly wealthy population. You can see these two little bumps at the, uh, at the left of this graph, which are mainly India and China. And what happens is when people get up to uh, you know, around $10,000 uh, GDP per capita, they want, start wanting stuff, stuff being phones and refrigerators and cars, and suddenly that puts an immense pressure on resources. And, and that's, uh, that's something that resonates quite well with a lot of politicians. Um, as we saw in some of the earlier talks about imaging, um, science has enabled new technologies. We started off uh, until about 1650 when the optical microscope was, uh, was invented. Anything we couldn't see with the naked eye just simply didn't exist. Since then, we've progressed through electron microscopy, uh, atomic force microscopy, and that's led to a whole range of different technologies as we understand actually what's going on at smaller and smaller scales. And as a result of that understanding, we're now beginning to get some control over things at uh, those kind of scales. So in 10 years of nanotechnology, uh, we've come quite a long way. And uh, a lot of the applications, I think, are going to be in the uh, where nanotechnology meets biotechnology life sciences. And uh, certainly a lot of our research recently on things like um, medical diagnostics has indicated that imaging, especially in vivo imaging, is going to be one of the, uh, the major issues. And it's, and it's not too bad, because it's only about 20 years since, uh, since we started off in this field when uh, Don Eigler uh, arrange 35 xenon atoms to spell out the names of his employers and uh, guaranteed himself a job for life. So, uh, But we've leveraged a lot of money through this. Um, one of the key things with nanotechnology was trying to get money out of governments and convince them. And since, uh, since about 2000, governments around the world have put in about 68 billion, but that's been, you know, that, that's been trebled by the investment in companies. And when, when I see a lot of government spending in an area, it doesn't really tell me anything. But when you see the corporate spending coming up, it means that uh, someone thinks there is something there. We've been doing nuclear fusion for a long time and uh, you know, put a similar amount into that without seeing any uh, economic returns. So what we're seeing, if we, if we look at you know, what was happening in nanotechnology, we see healthcare really being the, the biggest thing. Um, let's just take that off and have that kind of trajectory because that always indicates there's something wrong with the model when you see an exponential. It's a word that's usually banned. But what we're trying to do is uh, understand nature and build from the bottom up. And the, the reason for doing that is rather than having little sort of nano robots, anything like that, we can make use of biological processes such as, uh, such as a cell, uh, the information we're getting. And if you Look at how efficient the human genome is, 3. billion base pairs. Um, 
If we encode all of that in binary, that comes to something like 800 megabytes to give us all the information to create all, uh, all of us in the room and, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff that's, uh, that's secreted away in there as well. Whereas if we look at a copy of uh, Microsoft Office, that's about 1.3 gigabytes, and, and that doesn't co that's before we start writing any instructions about how to do anything. So you can see that how nature is very, very efficient, and, and we can say we're very clever because we've taken $900,000 worth of stuff and condensed it into an iPhone that costs... Uh, costs $500. Um, up until 20 years ago, this machine with 123 kilobytes of memory was controlling most uh, US satellites. So we have progressed. But just to put that into context, if we look at something like the, uh, the, the human brain and relate that to the amount of computing power on the planet, what we find is that the total amount of all the computing power on the planet, including all the supercomputers and everything else, is equivalent to about one human brain. So. Uh, so, so we put this all together, nanotech, biotech, information technology. You can see that the areas like synthetic biology, we're getting a curve that looks very much like Moore's Law, as it should, because a lot of this has been driven by IT. And even on the materials side, we're, we're seeing things like the Materials Genome Initiative in the, in the US now, where we're taking life, a life science approach to materials. So we are getting that interdisciplinary um, flavor. The reason we're doing this is if you look at something like this, this is a pest, a spotted asparagus beetle, and I, I like using pests because they're, they're usually very successful. Um, nature builds this from the bottom up, and it creates something that's got color, it's got uh, rigidity, it's breathable, it's, uh, it's waterproof. If we try to do that with polymers, we start with a lot of oil and then we throw most of it away, we use a lot of energy and we use about a hundred different polymers to get the same thing. Similar kind of thing with floating ferns like salvinia that have some neat little tricks just to trap a layer of air between themselves and uh, at the bottom. So we got this far with the World Economic Forum, and, and, and the question was, the, 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 the pushback you get is, okay, so, you know, you're doing all kinds of clever stuff, and, you know, you're just making some smaller iPhones and, uh, you know, slightly better things. Is that what it's all about? Well, um, and we said, well, no, it's not, because it's, it's all about this. It's, it's about people. It's about, it's about population. It's about resources. Um, that we're running out of, uh, and you know, we get an increasing list of critical materials where we have to find replacements uh, within the next 20 years. Um, it's also about disasters like this, and, and we started asking the question, well, we have all this science and technology, we know what's going on, why do we have to put up with this? Can't we maybe come up with an insurance policy based on technology that would allow us to do that. And I think uh, the conclusion was that, yep, yeah, we probably can. And through the World Economic Forum, we finally managed to get statements like this out that, are, that get noticed at a very high level. So sustained and responsible, responsible being the important thing here, technology innovation is the only way that we've supported six billion people and we can continue to support more and more people. Um, can we do this? Well, human ingenuity has given us everything from the wheel through to uh, the Industrial Revolution through to antibiotics. So uh, technology has always come to our rescue, and we have to make sure we can keep doing that. But to do that, what we're seeing is we've got to come up with some new and sustainable investment models. If you're trying to spin something out of a university, especially lab-based, people do look at Instagram and think they can make it a, a far easier buck there than... Um, than spending eight or ten years incubating something technical. Well, in fact, if you look at Facebook, it's been about seven or eight years, and normally that's, that's what I would say it takes to build any kind of decent company, so they're just about on, on the market. But people look at the anomalies. But there is, there is hope as well, because a lot of technologies are becoming more like Facebook. Um, if, if you look at what's happening in life sciences and IT, things that can have a big impact are being done by smaller and smaller groups now. So you don't have to just look at the IBMs and the Bell Labs for these world-changing technologies. Uh, and I think the conclusions we're seeing at the World Economic Forum, when we're, especially when we're looking at the European case, is that you know, it's not just a question of rescuing the economy through austerity by, by saving money. If we want to have this sustainable growth, then it's really got for it to be from the bottom up, and we have to let, uh, let a million flowers bloom to do that. Uh, there's also, from an economic point of view, a lot of profits to be made. Sustainability is on pretty much everyone's agenda. There's a lot of big problems out there with no obvious solutions, and uh, the customers for that aren't just going to be uh, you know, people wanting 
fancier, better stuff. It's going to be governments and international organisations as well. And this nano-bio-IT convergence is probably a once-in-a-century opportunity. So just to sum all of that up, um, what we're seeing when, we're, when we do try to plan for the future and try to figure out you know, where governments should be spending their money is that we, we're seeing that sort of this nano-bio-materials IT is probably going to be as important to the 21st century as things like oil and semiconductors were to the, to the 20th. And uh, I think we've got the tools, but we really have to be able to use them wisely and responsibly. And that means negotiating through the number of international treaties that govern the use of technologies, dealing with things like uh, public opinion, so that uh, when we have technologies such as genetic modification, we can actually uh, be free to use them in the service of humanity. And uh, if you want any more, will you follow me on Twitter or catch me there? Thanks. All right. So our speakers have, been, have kept us wonderfully on track, and so we have quite a lot of time for questions. So why don't we open it up for questions? And I think there are microphones uh, ready. Hello everyone, it's Manuel Rutao from GTK. Thank you for the talk and the, and the panel. Um, Manuel, thank you for being uh, naked, uh, in a sense. Uh, <laughs> since, sir, one of the questions uh, that uh, we are facing probably in Spain is uh, uh, to take into account that we are Spaniards, no? Uh, and that means a number of things. That means that we, we have probably to be prepared and to be trained and educated that we can and we probably may fail. I mean, our culture, when you fail, is a disaster for life. Uh, I mean, that uh, probably people may, uh, I mean, this, this has to be with the entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial uh, culture, uh, going back, as Fiona said, about culture. Huh? <laughs> so uh, I think uh, ambition uh, for all of us is probably one of the best uh, tries, uh, one, one of the best experiences that we are having in the country to try to put together and to make the prophecy and truth about all the things that we are uh, trying and saying in this in this conference and the project, uh, uh, the Ambition Consortium itself. What I would like to um, uh, get the point for you, the Spaniards, but also I have a couple of questions uh, for you, is about uh, the situation, the ecosystem that already happens in Spain. No? I mean, uh, we have, uh, and about your thoughts, uh, we have a lack of, uh, smart investors, I mean, generally, I mean, there is money in the country. There's a bunch of money that is being made by the uh, um, uh, real estate business and construction for the last years. And then now there's a paradigm that we are having all the papers that Manuel Desco was uh, saying yesterday, that we produce 3% of the papers on the planet, and we only translate 0.5%. So I've been asking him about if we have then a set of stock of knowledge, I mean, or is waste knowledge, I mean, that probably would be a consideration. So how we ca can manage this? So I think also the, uh, the, the, the project may, may represent an opportunity for foreign investors to come to the, to the uh, ecosystem, join the wonderful branding that Madrid and MIT represents, and we have an opportunity. So this is a consideration uh, that I would like to put on. So how do, you, how do you see, how do you feel about the financial system? and the venture capitals. And we have also two international venture capitals, three here. I mean, uh, Brian, Tim, and, and yourself, Fiona, you've been having experience. So how do you see probably uh, doing, doing uh, uh, investments in foreign countries, not in your countries? And I thought uh, that particular thing that you have been having experience in Spain before, no? for a number of years. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, one of the points, to know how do you, do you feel that. And one of the questions also for Tim Harper, uh, saying that uh, nanotechnology is gonna be probably one of the more promising uh, uh, drivers for technology, knowledge, and economy. I remember uh, in a previous conference that you mentioned the number of patents that currently uh, sits in um, uh, nanotechnology in the world, which is a big surprise. I would like you to share this with the audience, if it's possible. So thank you. failures. 
I usually say that uh, we've got a lot of experience because experience is what you get when you don't get what you wanted. <laughs> so we've ac accumulated a lot of experience in, th in these years and, uh, and you have to be used to fail. So um, one good thing about that is that uh, we, we have, I think, we can be used as an example that the whole thing may work even in, in our uh, ecosystem. So it's, it's a good point. And at the same time, we've uh, gathered a lot of knowledge about what's going wrong <laughs> in, the, in the environment. So we could, uh, we could um, contribute to um, improve the situation if somebody uh, is uh, able to listen to us. Okay, you understand. Then, uh, the second point is about investors. And uh, again, I, 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 I do not like uh, to cry uh, too much that there are few investors. But I think it's a much better idea. First of all, you try to demonstrate what you are able to do. And uh, it's not unlikely that investors will appear. So, mm, yeah, it's my opinion. So not cry so much, work hard, show what you can do. And, uh, and hopefully, investors will appear. In our case, they appear. Oh, we have to answer both questions first. Failure is not well accepted here. Um, we try to avoid failure, so we do nothing. But that's not our case. Um, because as Manuel said, we, we have thought about it differently. Uh, you know that real happiness is when, when you get what you want. And synthetic happiness is when you don't get what you want, but you accept it. And you are equally um, happy. So w we have taken the second approach, which uh, comes from Don Gilbert at Harvard, Medic uh, at Harvard University. This is explanation for synthetic happiness. So we are happy, <laughs> even if we don't get what we want. <laughs> um, because we have to do it. There's no other way. That's uh, 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 the first approach. And secondly, uh, the internal market is not our target. Um, there's, there's nothing here. I mean, there's something. But th there's nothing we can do be because the economy uh, and the financial, the fina financial um, situation is uh, really poor. So now we have started having uh, offers from Arab countries giving us money to um, push uh, technology uh, ahead. So we'll go out and find funding. We both are resigning from the team. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We are very much so. <laughs> well, uh, I think there are a couple of issues here. Uh, one is um, your concern that there isn't enough uh, venture money uh, to fund innovation. Uh, my belief is that there's a lot of traditional money here which has been made. And uh, my belief is that uh, money always looks for return. And uh, if you look at return, in the traditional investments uh, in the markets, uh, it's not getting you much. And so with time, that money will look at opportunities, which will give them, and with an economist in the room, I need to be a little careful, abnormal uh, uh, economic returns, which are superior to that, what the secular market gives them. Uh, the second point is, uh, there's an old story about a lawyer in a small town. He wasn't making any money until the second lawyer came to town and then both made a lot of money. So I think <laughs> it just takes time for the first venture capitalist to come uh, and establish and start generating uh, uh, returns that are impressive, and the next will come. And so I think uh, it's going to take a little bit of time, but, but it will happen as long as ultimately we generate ideas that can be converted into marketable uh, products and services. Well, I, I was talking to a couple of um, local entrepreneurs earlier today, and one of the things we were discussing is maybe the, um, the economic crisis at the moment is actually good for entrepreneurship, because uh, certainly my experience in Spain, traditionally people would say, well, you we should get a job with a bank or get a job with, uh, with the government, things like that, because they were seen as secure jobs for life. Uh, that's probably gone now. So when we talk about <coughs> this idea of failure, um, I think... Uh, because if you, you, can, you can say the whole of Europe is fail as a failure to, economically at the moment. So, uh, so people are a lot more um, uh, 
lot more uh, encouraged to be able to take a risk, I think. And, uh, and, and I think that sort of whole culture of failure may be changing a little bit, especially amongst uh, the younger people. O on the funding side, I, I always advise people not to get too hung up on this idea of venture capital because, you know, um, most companies aren't suitable for venture capital funding. They, you know, they won't give you that sort of 10x return within the lifetime of the fund, you know, three to five, six years. Uh, that doesn't mean they're bad companies. It just means you have to look at different financing mechanisms. We funded... Uh, most of our companies either by angels, just people you meet who just happen to be fascinated by the technology and willing to put up a bit of cash on some not too onerous terms, or by just leveraging things like government funding as well, because there's lots of it around in, in Europe. And I know it's a nuisance and it takes time to write all these projects and things, but it's, it's non-dilutive capital and it can get you a long way to, uh, to proof of concept and, uh, and beyond. So, and, and I think that sort of comes down to sort of something else we've learned when I've sit on all these various um, government funding panels around the world. One of the things you often ask people to do is have a sort of a risk matrix, and you want to look at sort of you know technological risk and management risk and you know whatever health and safety, whatever else. And we always say, well, you know, if there's a big technical risk, well, that's okay. That's not necessarily a bad thing because you know people are usually try to get all the risks down to medium or low because they think it looks better. But yeah, as a technological risk, as a, gov as a source of government funding, that's exactly what we're supposed to be putting the money into because these risky little things, you know, if they work, they're the companies that go from one person to 200 within a few years. If you put it into a low risk thing, you know, a company with 10,000 employees, well, after five years, they might still have 10,000 employees and, and, and what's, the, uh, you know, what's the effect of that capital? I, I can't remember that offhand, but uh, but I can tell you that the uh, the uh, largest number of patents involving nanomaterials are actually held by L'Oreal uh, rather than IBM or anybody you'd expect. <laughs> Can I just say something about failure? So I, I think that uh, some of failure is this cultural issue you talked about. Um, some of it is also government and institutional. It's about what happens to you in terms of your ability to have debt to raise future capital, and so there are some sort of policy pieces that can help. One of the most interesting things I heard recently were the um, founders of the, the game, you know, the Angry Birds game, which I'm sure many of you know and may be playing right now. Um, <laughs> they decided that uh, they had this failure culture problem in Finland. They were going to have um, a national failure day when people were actually going to stand up and talk about all their failures and what they learned from them in, in the spirit of, because in the Roma model of knowledge accumulation, they don't, you don't just accumulate from successful experiments. You actually, that accumulation function works with failed projects as well, and so I think we shouldn't um, forget about that. The other thing I think about investment is, uh, and this was a, a discussion that Yusef and I had in the break, that you know, venture capitalists don't have to be local. So although we talk about these regional ecosystems, and one of the things that I've seen in Turkey, and I've been doing some work around these issues in Istanbul recently, is actually really trying to tap into the expatriate network. And so, you know, the, who are the first venture capitalists to show up on the scene in Istanbul? They're the Turks from Boston, Silicon Valley, and so on, right? Who are the people that are most likely to show up in, in Spain, the venture capitalists? They're the ones who are, you know, you know, it's the expat Spaniards who say, oh, okay, let me go home. I kind of get how to do business there. And so tapping into the expatriate network, I think, is an extraordinarily valuable thing to do. Other questions? Um, just one short note. Um, <clears throat> if you are going to need uh, business angels or, or investors, well, you cannot ask his, the, the researchers, as Julio or myself, to look for them. What we need is, uh, is a professional structure of people who know who they are and where they are and call them. So, and that's one of the things we pursue with the, with the network, to provide such a support, because otherwise we are isolated, and, and that's much more difficult. Okay. Other questions? In true business school professor spirit, I'm happy to call on people. Huh. <laughs> Martha? <laughs> Just look to you. So you were just talking about how capital markets can come from, or venture capitalists, or how funding sources can come from anywhere. Um, and Fiona mentioned in her earlier remarks the importance of being local. and 
And so as we try to think about building a global consortium, which this is, but I think as in every institution is thinking about how do you make these global connects, can the panel sort of reconcile how you think about that in terms of innovation and making headway? And Fiona, how? <laughs> I'm going to hand it down the panel first. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Well, Local versus global, I think. Is the I actually was discussing with Yusuf uh, before the session about, about that topic. And in my opinion, the uh, locality has a different role depending on the stage of the project. So at the first stage, mm -hmm. locality is very important. You have to you have to have the coffee with the with the surgeon in order to to have the idea. Once the whole thing is, is running, probably n not necessarily has to be local. You, you can find partners wherever they they are. So that that role of locality uh, has to be defined in in the in the specific context of the project and in the specific stage uh, at the project uh, is at, at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Uh, you need to start local, but then you need a network. And you have to connect dots if you want to succeed, succeed uh, big time. So, um, in fact, this is like a regional and regional uh, collaborations, Boston and Madrid. So, two local uh, initiatives from uh, two different uh, areas with different uh, levels of development and research can collaborate to uh, to go global, uh, but. You have to, to have both. That's my idea. If you want to scale it, uh, to bring it up. My belief is if there's an unmet need, which is local, uh, or whether this unmet need is global, as long as it will generate profits, it will find capital. And uh, I was. Tim, I was using the term venture capitalist in the broadest sense yeah. of the term, not in the more uh, parochial mm -hmm. VC. Uh, it's capital which is willing to fund innovative ideas. Risk, risk capital. <laughs> it's a risk. Uh, I, again, yesterday, uh, um, Peter Farrell said, don't use risk capital, opportunity capital. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're changing the terminology a bit. Uh, the, the opportunity capital will, will, will follow it. And I think the best examples are China and India. Uh, in, in both China and India, there are uh, uh, hundreds of, of global firms who have a local presence, and there are hundreds of Indian firms, uh, Chinese firms, local firms, which have a presence. I mean, the last uh, uh, um, study I saw was that in the last 10 years, 500 private equity or opportunity capital firms have set up shop in India and have invested in companies. And the same number is approximately right, probably a little less in China. So capital is going to come. So the most important is you've got to generate ideas or innovation that can attract capital, for which I think organizations like Envision have uh, a good start because uh, by virtue of this cross-Atlantic a collaboration, there's an opportunity for these ideas to go beyond the local boundaries. And you know, at the end of the day, it has to be spotted for someone to be invest, investing in it. And this gives you an opportunity for visibility. And that's a, an important first step. It's like the old elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. you, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. But f most important, you've got to run into someone who can make the impression. And I think that's very important for an uh, initiative like this. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so, certainly with, with all the businesses I've been involved in, we, we haven't worried too much about this local versus global thing because uh, what you find is most of the markets we've been trying to play in are, are global markets. <coughs> uh, and that means you know, the capital can come from, from anywhere. Um, Often the limiting factor, though, is people, especially if you've got a spin out from a university and you're reliant on someone with a lot of knowledge inside their head at the beginning that you're uh, that you're trying to get at. Um, and and we've we have had problems with that limiting the, uh, the geographical scope and and also the investors you can you can deal with. Uh, some investors are happy to. Um, 
put money into things anywhere on, in the world, uh, whereas others are very picky about, you know, we only understand the legal, legal system in this particular area. Or it may be as simple as, you know, they don't want to drive for more than half an hour from their office to go to board meetings. Um, so the people tend to be local, the markets are global, and capital comes from anywhere. But I think probably the lesson you, you learn is if you can be world class at something, then it doesn't really matter where you put the company uh, or, or the business and people will come to you, but you have to get to get over quite a few hurdles to get to that stage where you're seen as world class. I mean, I think I, most, I basically would echo what other people have said. So I do think in the earlier stages, this sort of tight proximity between innovators and entrepreneurs is extremely important, right, and those who understand the problem and the solution. <coughs> particularly when you have tacit knowledge that's very difficult to, to really write down. I mean, the story of many of the startups that have come out of, you know, MIT, out of Oxford, you know, whether in the first year, nobody could make anything work. It just doesn't work when you move it out of the lab, even if you move it across the road. And so you really have to have people having coffee every day, figuring those things out. I think a lot of capital likes to be close by. But that's not because, just because of the driving issue, it's because of who you trust when you're trying to invest in these very early stage opportunities, there is a lot of uncertainty. And so trust-based relationships are very powerful. So the question is, can you have those at a distance? And I think you can when they're brokered by other things, like you know, a shared emotional tie, an expatriate network, shared connections. So the connection that we're forging between Boston and, and Madrid means that people know each other. And that will allow things to flow along those conduits. Um, and obviously, in the China and India case, the expatriate networks was massively powerful in jump-starting that. I mean, the first people, the first private equity folks to show up in India were kind of Indian-born, come to the US, going back. And we know that to be true. And so it's how do you really do that? And then they become local again, because it's actually efficient for them to go back to India. And so I think there is very much this dynamic of tapping into to global opportunities, absolutely. But you do need to have as much as you can to kind of build those resources locally in the long run so that you have a, and you also keep the jobs here. So the question is where do you want the jobs to be? So I think we have time for one last question. Or in true Madrid style, apparently it's two o'clock and it's time for lunch. So thank you <laughs> panelists very, very much.